So, welcome everyone. How are you guys doing? You having a good conference? Ah, sounds good. Yeah. It's always exciting to come back here to Joycom Italy. A lot has happened since I was here last year um, in terms of Gradle. It's basically a firework of new features and as well improvements of existing features, especially with respect to performance and productivity of developers. And that's what I want to go into um, because a lot of it also affects you obviously as an Android developer who is using Gradle as the build tool on the line, um, how you build your projects. <coughs> right. So my name's Etienne, I've been with Gradle for about three years. Um, I'm the lead of the project, uh, the build trip project, which is our Eclipse integration and I'm currently leading our efforts of Gradle Enterprise. <coughs> so just to get started, who in here is an Android developer? All right, so I would say like 90%, great. Um, and who has been using Gradle outside of an Android project? That's maybe 25%, okay. Right, so just to, to see how familiar you are. Um, and who of you would consider himself like a, a Gradle expert, ninja, or at least an advanced user, like who feels comfortable? Unfortunately, an advanced user. Okay. What makes it unfortunate? Okay, the reply was that they had a very good pipeline based on Eclipse, and now that's gone. All right, I hope you get back where you were in terms of productivity. <coughs> You're back there, okay, excellent. All right, <coughs> so just to put this a bit into perspective when I said it's been, a lot has been happening. Um, so huge adoption rate, many more projects on Gradle, many more projects or many more companies on Gradle. Um, also, when you look at how many Maven projects are there in GitHub, how many Gradle projects, how many M projects, how many new projects are created with the different build system, it's all going towards Gradle. Um, so, and this is also reflected in about 4 million downloads every month of our Gradle build tool. All right, just to give a very l minimum context, because I'm going to come back to that specific context over and over again in this presentation a one minute intro of Gradle, if that is even possible, while still doing the build tool justice. Um, so basically you describe your build logic in build scripts. You can have one build script, multiple build scripts, you can have it all in one project, you can distribute the logic across multiple projects that are part of the same multi-project build that is totally flexible and up to you. When you run the build and you tell Gradle to run certain tasks, Gradle will take this build script reason about them and create a task graph. Right. That is the outcome of taking your build scripts during the configuration time or the configuration phase, is you end up with a, a DAG. I direct it, a cyclic graph. Right. And then in the second phase, the execution phase, those tasks that you requested are executed. Right. And so just to give a little bit of context already because this is a, is a pain point currently, but not much longer in Android is, during the configuration phase, not really any work should be done except preparing the task graph. And only when you execute the tasks, the specific work of those tasks should be executed. Right. All right, so give me a very, let me give you a very short demo. Um, I can make that a bit bigger if it's too small. Forgot about that. Can you read that? Yep, good. Okay. Um, so basically, what I have, and I have it open in in um, in idea, is a very small project. If I want to go back here, um, it's pretty almost too sm too small. I have a very small project that compiles some Java code, but that's not the point. The point is really that we have a build script here, right? 
And since the screen is so big, I think I'm gonna just make the font a bit smaller. Usually the font is not that small. One second size, let's make this 18, even 16. Okay. All right, still reasonable, uh, readable. So basically what we describe here is a little plugin. We say we wanna use the Java library plugin. We say, say where to fetch our dependencies. We define what dependencies we're actually consuming and what are we also offering to consuming projects. And we also define uh, our own tasks. So the key why I'm showing this is that just by including this plugin and defining our dependencies, Gradle has enough information to create this task graph but we can at all times also create our own tasks. Right. Um, and then I can go to the command line and I can do, for example, say Gradle build, um, or I can say, show me all tasks. Um, and you see that, and that's also something that got a lot faster if you have, especially for Android, if you have like a long configuration phase, running Gradle tasks with the latest Gradle version is much faster because it doesn't try to create the whole task graph and find your, um, your leaf nodes as it used to do in the past, right? And then you can see all the tasks that are available, either because you declared them yourself or they were contributed by a plugin, right? That's all in here. A few line breaks because the screen is a bit small, right? <coughs> okay, and then of course, as I said, I can, I can run a build and it will do the work that is needed. Okay, so, so much to get started. Now, a key feature of Gradle, and that's, very important in, in a lot of scalability features that we've added and that we're gonna add, also in the context of Android, but also in the general context of Gradle, incremental builds. Who's familiar with the feature of incremental builds? Like, okay, so we have like a few people that could probably describe it. Um, so the observation we can make is that typically in a build between one invocation and the next, not much changes in your build. You add a few source files, you change a few source files, you add some dependencies, you change some tests, and that's pretty much it, right? And so if you only change little, you also want to only little work be done by the build. <coughs> that's, and that's true on all levels. Like you don't even wanna build a project if that project is not affected by the change. But it's also an um, it also applies on a very low level when you have a single task and the task's inputs and what it creates does not change between that invocation and the next, then it shouldn't invoke that task anymore. Right. That is, that is a, a very fundamental. Right. So basically we wanna reuse what we've been doing before. Um, so if we just very simply lay this out, it's a function basically that has a set of inputs, it does some transformation and it creates an output right. or multiple outputs. And the task, let's say the compile task, let's take as an example, what is our input? We have source files, we have a certain compiler version, we have some flags that we pass into the compiler and the output is a set of class files in a given folder. Right. So we have a set of inputs and, and we create some outputs. That's the same for all tasks, right? An input could be a library, the output could be, be the Dex library. <coughs> right. And so basically when those inputs don't change and the output is still there, next time you run it, you still wanna use that output um, and so don't need to rerun the task. Okay, let me show that again here. Um, I'm just gonna call clean, so we don't have anything generated on in our build folder, basically. And if I now run Gradle build, um, you can see that everything that doesn't have like a, a yellow mark means there was some work done, right? So it had to compile the Java classes, it had to create a jar file, create the test classes, run the tests, and so on, right? Uh, so if I now run this again, we can see that everything is up to date. Some are marked as no source because that means not that they don't have any source code, it just means they don't really have any inputs. And so nothing has to be done because I didn't define any resources. All right, so, so basically what we're leveraging here is that we are reusing the output from the previous build. 
just to make this a bit more um, interesting, of course I could go, I go into util test here and I'm just gonna change one, one line and now we're gonna run it again. And now try to think of what is gonna change. I, I made the, tail, the test fails now because I changed the number, right? but that's not the point. What you can see here is that compile test Java. Yes, it had to recompile my test because I changed the test. But you can also see that compile Java, that's the, the, the production code, it did not have to be recompiled because it wasn't changed. Right, so only the minimum of work is done for the minimum that has changed. <coughs> All right, so let me rework that change so we're not gonna constantly run into red builds. Okay, so that is nice. This has been around forever. I don't know, Gradle 0 0.5 or something, maybe even earlier. Um, but we can do better. What if, now what if you change to a different branch? You run some builds, you come back to master, and now you rerun exactly the same builds in the same state that you had before you switched to the branch. Well, it's gonna re-execute everything because all the inputs um, are different and the outputs are different, um, assuming that what you did on the branch is different. So nothing is reused except what has been run exactly in the previous build, right? But that would be nice, right? Or if our CI server runs the same build in the morning and then when I get to work and I check out the build, I run it, well, I have exactly the same state as on CI. So wouldn't it be nice if I could just reuse what has been built on CI earlier on? Or potentially even from a different developer, though that's a very li less likely use case. And that's where the build cache comes into play. That's a very new Gradle feature. It's in 3.5. It's marks ex experimental, but we're already using it internally on our, all our production builds. Um, and it will be a final non-experimental version in Gradle 4.0, so within the next few months. Right. So what you get with the, with the build cache is that we can reuse outcomes from previous build, but not only from the very last previous build. And we can also reuse outcomes that were not even generated by us, but by some other entity. Right. There are two caches. There is a local one that's on your machine, and there is one that runs remotely. Potentially in the future, there could be even multiple caches running. Right. But this is the current distinction that we have. And that cache survives your build invocation. Right. So even if you run a clean, we'll see that in a second, the cache survives all that. What do we currently cache? We cache the task outputs. That's why it's important what I showed you before. We're gonna come back to that again in a second, right? So we, I said before we have the inputs, we do some transformation, we create an output. So what happens with the cache key, uh, with the cache feature of Gradle is when you run the task, it creates a hash from the inputs and that gets your, becomes your cache key. And what's the value? It's the output that the task creates. Right, so nothing's in the cache. It runs the tasks. Task, it puts the value that was created, the output, into the cache. Sorry, into the cache with that key. And then when you rerun the build and you access that cache, it can get the value from there. So if you think about things like yeah, dexing or, or all the merge tasks that happen in Android, if that is done once and then you redo it, with exactly the same configuration, the same input configuration, you can just reuse that expensive operation, the, the, the result of that expensive operation. Right. <coughs> so an example of the compile task, the hash key, uh, the cache key, like I said, will be a hash over all the inputs. So that's the source files, the compiler flag, the compiler version, and the output is a file tree of classes, and that's put into the cache. Right. All right. So let me show you that again, what this means. Um, I can still stay in my, oops, in the little intro project. So first what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run Gradle clean. And like we saw before, if I just run Gradle build, it's gonna re rebuild everything because there is nothing local in my build, pro in my build folders of my project, right? But let's say I run it with Gradle build, dash dash build cache. So 
So what you can see now is, if you look at this part here, right, it didn't compile anymore, even though I didn't have anything in my local build folder. It also didn't have to recompile the test classes or the test sources to classes. It didn't even have to run the tests. So basically, it didn't have to run any verification. Right. And you can see that compile Java, it took the output from the cache, compile test Java, took the output from the cache, test, it took the output from the cache. You could ask yourself, well, why didn't it do the same for jar? Like the jar has the input is a set of class files and resources and it creates a jar file. That's because we have made the experience that it's usually faster to create a jar file than it is to fetch it, extract it, and release it, right? So that's based on experience. And so if you look at that, that I mean, this is extremely powerful. And I'll show you some numbers um, afterwards. Um, but if you imagine that a task takes 10 minutes, let's say you have a big source, source tree, takes 10 minutes to compile, and now your neighbor wants to compile the same sources, he can just cut 10 minutes. You have 500 developers, you, know, you can do the math yourself. Right. So that's basically, that's in very short how you experience the cache feature. Um, what you can also see down here is you get a little summary when you run with the cache. And as you can see, you have to explicitly enable the, da the ca build cache to be used. That's because, as I said, it's still experimental, though very stable. Um, but it will be non-experimental in 4.0, and then that flag is not needed anymore, right? Then it can be on by default, right? So what you see down here um, is a little summary that is printed whenever the build cache is enabled. And that allows you to optimize your build. So you can see 27 of the tasks were up to date, even when I run Gradle clean build, because they didn't really have anything to do. They were kind of life cycle tasks. Some tasks didn't have any source. They didn't have to do anything. And then you see that 27% were, were loaded from the cache. So that's the amount of tasks of those 11 tasks, in this case, three tasks, that were using the output taken from the cache. And then, interesting, there were three tasks that were not, they were run because they couldn't use something from the cache. And that's where your potential is to decrease that number. Right? Like I said, making, going down to zero makes no sense if it's, if it's more expensive to get it from the cache. But typically in a large project, you will have all sets of all kinds of tasks that could be cacheable, but that are not by default. Uh, and then you can kind of work on that. And how you can work on that, we'll see in a, a bit later when I show build scan. Right. All right. <coughs> so let me put this in, into a, uh, like a real context. What I show you here, I mean, this is, this is very sophisticated and it's, like I said, it's extremely powerful, especially when you have a, a big team and a big build where saving minutes multiplied by number of developers just adds to huge numbers. Um, what you see here is a setup that is the one we use in our company and that's also one we recommend to other companies. Like I said, there are two caches. There's one you have local to your machine and then there's one that is remote. You don't need a remote one, but that's the two, two, two distinctions that you can have. Um, so as a developer, typically, you always want to push to the local cache and you want to consume from the local cache. So even if you're disconnected from, from the internet, you rerun the build, it puts the artifacts in the cache and it reuses those artifacts the next time. Then you have CI. Like I said, a typical scenario is CI runs all the time. All the changes are constantly rerun. CI puts the outputs into the remote cache. And it also consumes, sorry, I, uh, it also consumes from the remote cache, <coughs> which also makes CI faster, of course. What also happens is that as a developer, you want to consume from the remote cache. So whatever CI produces as cache inputs or as cache entries, you want to consume them locally but not the other way around, typically. Because as a developer, you run many different experiments. You add a little bit of print lines, you add a, a source file there, you take it away, you refactor stuff. So all those things create cache entries that are typically not very interesting for other developers because they have different configurations. So then 
of sources and changes, and then it's not really reusable. <coughs> but on CI, where you don't have local changes, you can reuse that on a local machine. Um, so, so that is a typical um, setup. In the future, we can make this more sophisticated, or we can make it even smarter, I should say, both on the client and the server side. So we can make the Gradle client smarter in saying, well, I don't only want to talk to one remote cache, but I want to talk to multiple caches, and I want to pick the one that is most local to me. Let's say you're in, an, in a you're in a company that has offices in Italy, Turkey, Greece, Switzerland, and um, you have this cache cluster basically, and you want to be sure you talk to the most, the closest cache basically. We can also make the server smarter, the cache, I mean by that, the cache server smarter, by saying, well, we have different locations of caches, and we want to share them between the different locations, even between the US and Europe, for example, but we still want to make sure that the developers only go to the cache in their, in their time zone. So we can have synchronization between the caches. Uh, and that's, that's something we work on in Gradle Enterprise. How would the configuration of this look? And it's worth watching this because this is all also going to be available in Android as I'm going to show you towards the end. Right. How do you configure the cache? Basically, you just say, do you want to use a local cache or not? And here I'm, I introduce my, my own variable called ACI. So basically, this configuration you see here is, is for the diagram you see here. So if I'm local, um, sorry, if I'm not on CI, I want to enable the local cache. If I'm CI, I want to push to the remote cache. Right. But if I'm a developer, I don't want to push to the remote cache. That is one kind of setup. How smart you make this, how dependent on many uh, other factors, that's totally up to you, right? That is just a Gradle DSL where you can put in any logic as much as little as you want to. Right, so super powerful feature. And it's already used by very large software companies that have gone down with their times from building in 20 minutes in the morning, going for a coffee while it's building, having another coffee while it's still building, to like under a minute. Right. So it's huge. <coughs> and it's not that Gradle was just wasting time, it just had to do a lot of work, right? Compiling all those sources, generating, regenerating all those projects after all the changes overnight from a different continent, it just takes time. With respect to Android, um, basically any task can be made cacheable. You just need to make sure that your inputs and your outputs are clearly declared, um, that you annotate the task as being cacheable, and that's basically it. Right? Um, so currently the Android, the Google Android team, together with the Gradle team, they're collaborating closely anyway, are working on making the Android tasks cacheable. And you can expect that to be in without any promise, um, but it's planned to be in um, in Android 2.5. Right. We could, of course, also cache more than just task outputs. And a, a well can or a good candidate is, for example, take dependencies or going further, transform dependencies. So if you have dependencies, you dex them, you could also cache those dependencies those text can dependencies, or dependencies transformed in any other way. <coughs> if you want to know more, you can also there's the user guide that explains the, the concept behind it. Right. All right, so with this, let's get to the next topic. Um, we have looked at how we can avoid work by reusing what has been done before. Uh, but we can be more fine-grained we can really look at the changes as a single change and decide, hmm, if that has changed, does this over here really need to be redone, recompiled in this example, or in this specific use case? Right, and that's where compile avoidance, ABI change detection, and incremental, incremental compilation comes into play. Right, and I'm gonna show you that. So basically, we just wanna avoid recompiling stuff when it doesn't need to be recompiled because it's not because it's not affected by the change. Right. So I'm going to give you a small example, a little demo. 
and uh, the setup is really easy. We have an application and we have a library, right? I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with this setup um, and the app consumes the library. Right? And it does so on the level of the sources. We'll see that we have a source in app that uses a source or a class, I could say, in library. Right. <coughs> All right. So let me go to idea. So just to give you a bit of context, what we have is an app and we have a library. And in the app, here we have um, an app, a file called app. And in the library project, we have a class called utils. Right. So if we give this a little bit more space here for a moment, you can see that this app uses a class called utils, which is defined um, in this um, library. Right. So different modules of the same project. This is our utils class in the library project. Right. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna make a change to the, the class in library, utils.java, and I'm gonna run the build. Actually, let me make sure you can believe me. So I'm just gonna go to the compile avoidance. I'm gonna run Gradle build, see what's happened, everything's up to date. Okay, so now let's start. I'm gonna comment out this line here, which means we have a change in the utils class. So what do you expect to happen if you haven't heard of compile avoidance? Exactly, you expect everything to be recompiled, including the classes in the app, because the app is consuming that project and that project has changed or its sources have changed and it depends on those sources. So let's see what happens. Well, it definitely had to compile the library because the sources did change, yes. But you can see that the application did, did not have to recompile its, its Java classes. Right. And that's because the change I made was not part of the ABI, the application binary interface. So it was a totally internal change to that class. And if it's only an internal change to that class that is not part of its public API, the consumer doesn't need to be recompiled. And that's, is, that is compile avoidance. And you get that for free. You also get that with Android um, as of 3.4, Cradle 3.4. So. All right, so that's the first use case. So let me put it back. I run it again. We will again see that it didn't have to be compiled Java. Uh, it, of the app, sorry. It did, of course, for the library, right? What we can also see is that since the library class has changed, it also had to rebuild the jar file. Right. So let me do a little quiz here. Let's say I go like this. I'm changing this comment. It had to recompile the classes, but it didn't have to recompile, it didn't have to regenerate the jar file. How come we changed the sources of that jar file? Any ideas? Sorry? Yes. Yep. So, correct answer, and I'm just going to repeat it, but in my own words, but it's basically the same. Um, so we changed the sources, yes, but we changed them in a way that we just appended the comment to an existing comment. So the bytecode that you end up with is exactly the same one. And if the bytecode is exactly the same one, well, incremental build kicks in, which means same classes. I still have the jar from the last build. Let's reuse it. So it didn't have to rerun the jar task. Okay. Which also shows that none of this is based on timestamps. It's all based on hashes of inputs and outputs, right? Because the timestamp did change. It's, it's, it, yeah, it, we, because we, we had to recompile the class, but the binary code is exactly the same. <coughs> All right. Now we could we can do even better. We can do even better. Oh, or let me give you one more example. I can have this public foo 
Um, let me, if I just add something private here, that will also not re-trigger a compilation of my app because it's a private method, it's not part of the public API. <coughs> All right, so that is the um, ABI usage tracking. And then the last version, and I'm just gonna show this briefly. Let's say we have an application that you see here, it's using utils. You can see that here. We have another app that is using another utils. So we have one class here consuming this class. We have another class in the app that consumes another library class. So if we make now a change to one of the classes in utils, in, in library, another utils, what is the minimum that we need to recompile in the app? Right. I make a change here. Add, I'm saying, some. So I changed another utils. Who was affected by that? It was another app, because another app consumes another utils. So if I now run this, Gradle will detect the delta in the library and see, oh, it was only another utils that changed. Who depends on the another utils? Oh, it's only another app, so let me only recompile another app and not app as well. With two classes, not really much of a difference, but if you have 100,000 classes or sources in the same module and only one class over here changed, and there's only one consumer of that class in that project here. The other 999,000 don't need to be um, recompiled. Right. And that is where incremental compilation comes into play. Right. It's a bit hard to demo because I would have to enable the info log that you could actually see that it tells us only one class has been recompiled versus two. Right, so I'm, I'm gonna skip that step here. So trust me on that one. <clears throat> so there's, there's actually a lot of smartness in that, of course, to track the dependencies of the classes. And now to finish this part, what you also have to, or should keep in mind, when also with Android applications, I think typically they're very large. You have, you have very large projects, right? So large trees and not too many submodules because it comes with a high price. Not much longer, but right now it still does. Um, Compile avoidance only works between modules, right? So if you only have one module, you don't get any benefit from compile avoidance. If you have many small ones, you have a lot of benefit. Also with detecting API changes, ABI changes and where they're used, that's only available across modules. So again, if everything's in one project or in one module, you don't get any benefit from that. But then we have incremental compilation and that works even within a single module. Right. So you have one class that changed. Gradle tracks or figures out who depends on it, not only in different modules, but also within the same module. So one class changes, very likely also its unit test changes. Right. So it knows, oh, from all the tests I have to run, I have to recompile that one test class, but I don't have to recompile all the other tests. So in the benefit of incremental compilation, which you will also have in Android, um, you also get within a single project. But for the other ones, it still makes sense if you use, um, if you try to have m many small projects. Of course, in a reasonable structured or separated in a reasonable manner. Okay. <coughs> So that is the compile avoidance. And just to give you one example, that's from the Java world. Um, and I, you see one from the Android world right after. Um, you have one large project here. Um, and these are sample projects that are open source. You, can, you could even look at the code, run them yourself. Um, and you can see that if you use like Maven um, or Gradle 3.3, there's about, yeah, not quite half the time. Um, <coughs> But with Gradle 3.4, if you make one change, then the amount of time that is spent executing goes way down because it doesn't do any unnecessary work. Right. 
And you can see it in, this, in the third sample. I cannot really leave this microphone, sorry, so I'm kind of stuck here. Um, if you look at the second one from the right, if you change the ABI, so you change the public, the binary interface, the public interface of a class, um, the time goes down to 3.3 seconds compared to like 15.8 before that feature of incremental compile and compile avoidance was introduced. <coughs> if you make a change that doesn't even affect the ABI, the time goes down to 1.4. Right, so it's a, it's a huge effect or a dramatic effect that it has to only do the work that is actually needed. Right. So here's an example from the Android world. We have this performance Android large project. It has been created from real world, very large Android projects, probably some of the biggest in the world um, that we're in touch with and we have anonymized them, but we have reused the concepts basically or their structure. And um, what you can see if you run this with like an old version of Gradle and an old version of the plugin, um, so Android plugin 2.2, Gradle 2.14, it takes basically six minutes to run. Um, if you use Buck, it only took 80 seconds. If you use Gradle 2.3, uh, sorry, Android plugin 2.3, which is available today, right? And Gradle 3.4, you're down to 90 seconds. And if you use the latest 2.5 version of the Android plugin, which is still alpha but available, and Gradle Master, or no, sorry, not Master, Gradle 3.5, you get even down to 80, so you're on the same level as Buck. Right? And if you then make ABI or non-ABI changes, it gets even more dramatic. Right? Or a no-op, no-op change, basically, because there's nothing to do, so there shouldn't take any time to do nothing. <coughs> if you want to know more, you can get some links. All right, Worker API. I'm just going to keep this very short, but this is really, uh, I think it's going to be very helpful for, for Android people as well who have been in troubles with memory, size, allocation, and so on. Because basically what Gradle offers um, with 3.4 and future version is you get a Worker API that allows you to offload work. So your tasks consist of actions, and you can, the can tell the worker API, run those tasks for me. And you can, it will run them for you in parallel. Right? And it will do so in a parallel safe way. Right? That's basically what it comes down to. So if, if you need to do dexing, or not you, but if the Android plugin wants to do some dexing, for example, it can offload that to a worker API, which then does it in an external process or an internal process. Well, in that case, probably an external process. But you, you as a plugin writer can decide if you want to run in process or out of process. Right. And then Gradle synchronizes um, or manages those daemons that run the actual work. I'm not going to demo that, but I, I, I think you get the concept. So parallelism is really core to scalability of a build. And Gradle now gives you the tool, or you, I mean, it gives it to plugin developers to say, tell me what you want to run, and I'll make sure I coordinate the work to run in parallel across different daemons, shut down the daemons when not needed anymore, and so on. Right. right. Just briefly, the Gradle daemon, it's been around for a long time, but it hasn't been made stable or marked as stable until 3.0. So basically the Gradle daemon means that when you run a Gradle build, you, you delegate it to a daemon which runs in its own process. It's a separate JVM and you can have multiple daemons running in parallel. Um, and so one thing you gain is that the Gradle daemon can cache, can cache stuff beyond a single build invocation, right? It can do a lot of class loader caching, other memory, um, other in-memory caching that you can reuse between builds. And it create, gives you a hot JVM, it gives you um, the hotspot, can really be warm and be really be optimized, right? So there's no point in not running with the Gradle daemon anymore, and it's enabled by default, right? So let me just give you one small example. Oh man, I cannot leave my keynote anymore. Yeah. 
Okay, I think my whole computer is frozen. Which rarely happens with a Mac. Let me let me just try to unplug it. I can. All right, so I'll just continue with without the, the laptop then, and I'll have to save or have to skip the demos. So another feature we've introduced quite a little time ago, quite some time ago is the composite builds. Anybody knows what composite builds are? Oh, there's like one hand. I can see one single hand. Okay, and that is often the answer. Almost nobody knows it, but it's a very powerful feature because it allows you to combine multiple projects that have nothing to do with each other um, and com combine them into a new multi-build, into a new multi-project, right? And so what you can do, then that's a typical scenario, is you have an application, you have a library that is a totally different project, and now you see there's a problem in the library. So what do you do? You go to the library project, you make a change, typically, you publish it somewhere, and on the app side, you consume it, you check if it's good. If not, you go back to the library, make the change, push it, consume it. So you have always th this long circle between making a change and consuming the change. With composite builds, you can combine that and say, well, if I run my app, instead of using the dependency from the remote location, use it from that other project. And so you can just make a change in your library and it's instantly used in the app without any publication. No Maven local or any Nexus repository, nothing. Right. So you can, of course, nicely debug that. Um, and it's all, even you can import it into the IDE as a single project. So it, it feels like it's one project. You make the fix and once it's confirmed to work, you can just stop using it as a composite build. Right. That's another very powerful feature. <clears throat> Um, we also have the ID integration. You know it from Android Studio. Um, it allows you to synchronize projects. What we're also doing more and more is to, is to give you insights of what's happening. So we have what call, we call build operations, which means when you run a build, we give you a lot of things started, thing ended, task started, task ended, dependency resolution started, finished, what dependency was resol resolved, and so on. And we can also visualize that in a graphical, in a tree way, in the UI, in the UI, I mean, in the IDE. Right. <clears throat> so, next point, Kotlin. Um, some of you might use Kotlin for Android development. What we're currently working on, and it's probably ready by summer or by fall at the latest, is that you can describe your Gradle build using the Kotlin language. So instead of having like a, a Groovy derived DSL, it will be a Kotlin derived DSL. So the expectation is it runs faster because there's no dynamic um, nature involved. Kotlin is totally uh, statically typed. Um, but also you get all the convenience you know from writing production code. You get code completion, you get syntax highlighting, you get navigation, you get refactoring. So as you write your build scripts, you don't constantly have to ask yourself, hmm, what can I put here? But you will get all the assistance you're used to when you write production code. Next thing I wanted to show really is about those insights. I mentioned in the beginning, if you run a build and you have some issues and you want to share with a colleague, what do you currently do? Right. You run a build, it fails, or a test fails. Well, you probably take the output, you paste it into mail, you write some description, what machine you were running it on, what Java version, and so on. You get back an email saying, can you give me more information, and so on. What we do with build scans, and that's an offer, for, uh, it's a free service. When you run the build, it can capture data, send it to a server, and visualize it. And you can just share a link with your colleague saying, go look there, and it will, he will see what was run in the build, what tasks, what tests, what was the log, what was the environment, what was the performance of the build. Right. So that's what's called build scans, and we're currently and enriching that with Android-specific information, right? So as you run a build, you get 
you get of like a little capture that is stored forever and you can share it, you can compare it and so on, right? To really understand what's happening in your build, right? Okay. <clears throat> I also wanted to add one important slide, which was what can you expect from the Android plugin 2.5? Right? But with a frozen laptop, it's ne not easy. So I'll try to remember it all from my head. Um, so just starting high level, what you get is you get uh, many improvements from Gradle that makes things faster. And I showed you the key concepts. You also get a lot of improvements in the Android plugin itself. So they were recent, in the past, they were doing a lot of work that wasn't really necessary. Like, resolving all the dependencies of all the variants at configuration time, and so on. Or creating the whole AR just to then fish out the merge, um, the manifest file, and use it in, in another project. Right, so all those things have been optimized. And they're now all based on Gradle core infrastructure, which means as we make improvements in Gradle, the Android plugin will automatically benefit from them, which was not the case in the past because they were doing a lot of stuff on their own because Gradle didn't offer it. You will get very and very dependency management. I, I promised this basically last year that we're working on this and now it's going to be available in 2.5, right? And this is big. And you will see that as you add more variants, the, the overhead becomes linear instead of exponential as it has been in the past. Very and very dependency management also comes with um, parallel download of the dependencies, parallel download of the artifacts, and so on. Annotation processing will be a key concept. It will come with its own configuration, which gives you then better um, compile avoidance. That's another thing that is coming. Right, so, yes, to finish this. So overall, you can look very much forward to the Android plugin 2.5, which will work with Gradle 3.5 or Gradle 4.0. And you can expect a dramatic improvement in, um, in performance, right? And if you look at all those features, they really add up to, to this increased performance and increased developer productivity. All right. all right, and now I wish you a good rest of the conference. Thank you.